Roses. Rose scented soaps. Room fresheners. China. Boxes. Textiles, teacups, teapots, picture frames, perfume scents, on and on and on, all inspired by the elegant and ancient rose. Today we're going to talk about the history of roses, why they're so beloved, the different kinds of roses, and how you can grow roses without any experience at all in your garden. Because everybody's garden needs at least one lovely rose bush. Here I get a good picture of these beautiful little drift roses before they completely wilt because they are not in water. And since they're here on the table, these are simply drift roses I think they're knockout drift, drift, drift roses, really easy roses to grow. And this one is called apricot drift. Beautiful, beautiful. And this is just a raspberry apricot drift rose. Ground roses, easy to grow, and you can find them just about anywhere. But let's get on with our roses. And if you really want to know about roses, find yourself a couple really nice books all about Roses. Sipping some tea as we have our talk about roses, drinking Harney and Sons Royal Wedding Tea, white tea with pink rosebuds, and though you cannot really see those rosebuds anymore in the tea bag, you can really taste them. This is a really nice light sweet tea, and our teacups and teapot are Crown Dorset, Fine Bone China from England, Staffordshire, fine ceramics. Oops. We'll be using two books, 100 Old Roses for the American Garden by Claire G. Martin and Gardening with Roses by Judith McKeon. Now often when we think about roses we think of this long stemmed variety rose which is something that's really easy to find. It's often what you'll find in the florist and even the grocery store where you can purchase generally about a dozen roses, long-stemmed roses, for anywhere from $10 to $12. And this is more of a modern rose. It has very little scent, and though it's very, very beautiful and elegant, it really isn't what we're going to be concentrating on today. Now this rose actually was from the grocery store this morning. I bought a dozen roses just for this video. But what I want to talk about more today are the old roses, the old-fashioned roses, the ones with a lot of scent, the ones that produce rose hips, the ones that you can easily grow with abandon in your own garden. And so today, let's just concentrate a little bit on the old roses. Now, according to the book on old roses, an old rose refers to any rose that was introduced before 1901. In other words, before the beginning of the 20th century. Now there are other old roses that are actually truly old roses, and those are species roses. Those are wild, wild roses. And those are the kind of roses that we often find around here. In fact, I have some species roses that just grow like crazy over my grape arbor. Instead of grapes, I've got incredible wild roses that I found in the woods one year. But we're not talking about those today. We're going to talk about the roses that you can put into your garden and you're going to find out that the queen of flowers, which absolutely is cherished by many gardeners, is really not that difficult for you to grow. Hybrid tea roses are roses with a history of barely less than a hundred years. So 
if these roses like this are less than a hundred years, what are old roses? They must be terribly, terribly old. And they are. They're the roses that were in medieval gardens. They are the roses that Shakespeare spoke about. And they are roses with a world of different shapes, colors, and forms. Old roses truly come in an abundance of shapes and colors and forms, sizes and heights. You've got climbers and shrubs and bushes and ramblers. Everything you could think about. And they actually grow with quite a bit of easy care. Many of them are disease resistant. And the most important thing in my book is they are scented. Old roses are also separated by class. You have the Gallica roses, which are also known as French roses. We've got Damask roses brought back to Europe by the Crusaders, it is said. Centifolia roses, also known as cabbage roses. They're from 17th century France and Holland. Alba roses, which are basically the beautiful, lush, and fluffy, and luxurious roses that you'd find in uh, Renaissance paintings. We've got China roses. They first appeared in European gardens between the middle of the 18th century. And tea roses, developed in China. Portland roses and bourbon roses. Hybrid teas and hybrid perpetuals. We have ramblers and rugosas and polyanthas. Ah, oh, on and on and on it goes. So there's a lot to know about roses, and we certainly are not going to get into all that today. Roses really can be integrated into your garden, no matter what your garden style is. You don't have to have just a hedge of roses with nothing else. If you've got a country garden or a cottage garden, roses are a beautiful addition to it. They just enhance everything else. Think of a Victorian rose garden. You think of just nothing but roses growing in there. Roses, rose hedges, but not a really fully integrated cottage garden or a country garden like this. That's the beauty of roses, really, when they have companions, when they're in the middle of a cottage garden or a garden bed or a garden border growing along with peonies and chives and annuals and perennials. That's when they really are their very, very best, in my opinion. So today I'm going to show you that growing roses is really, really quite easy. Other than wanting a good home with a sunny location and consistent watering and feeding, I don't think roses are difficult to care for at all. You can get roses that are disease resistant, thornless even, and repeat bloomers. You can get roses that enjoy a little bit of shade. You can get roses that produce big, beautiful rose hips to use in the winter. I just love those. And you can get roses of every shape, size, and color. So let's go plant some roses. We'll talk a little bit about them, how to take care of them. And I think by the end of the video, you're going to want to get online and go to a rose nursery and get at least one beautiful rose bush for your garden. Can you believe it? You know, I just don't think you could ever ever, ever get enough roses to put in the garden. In fact, it could become a real obsession. That's why some people become rosarians. They just can't stop. But some of these, uh, this is a cabbage, called a cabbage rose. Isn't that wonderful? It does look like a big pink fat cabbage. I just love that. Wow. Just beautiful. I just fall in love with all of them. Here we have a Bourbon Rose, 1838. This is a great book. It really can learn a lot about the history of roses and their care. But the websites that I'm going to lead you to today at the end of the video will tell you everything you need to know as far as the location for your roses, the care that you will need to give it, and the size, the height, and everything you need to know. I think you'll be wanting to do some roses by the end of this video. Today's order came from the Antique Rose Emporium and they were just packed beautifully. Let's take a look. I'm pretty impressed with the packaging on these roses. Each one is a two gallon pot wrapped in a plastic bag and cushioned with the newspaper all around the soil to keep the moisture in. 
Some of the roses are fully leafed and others have been stripped of their leaves purposefully and it really depends on the kind of the rose as to whether or why they would strip the leaves off but either way it doesn't really matter. See that uh, the roses are still moist because of the newspaper that's been wrapped around the base of the plant. Each plant is marked with its name clearly. This is Marquesa Bocella. Wonderful. And these are going to be pretty easy to plant because you're just going to dig a hole, put a little compost in it, and we'll get to that next. Now this rose company is the Heirloom Rose Company. I, these were the first roses that I purchased and I think I was a little bit impulsive because they actually were twice as expensive as the antique Rose Emporium roses. They look healthy. They're one gallon pots. They weren't wrapped quite as fastidiously as the other ones. They, they had the plastic bag but no paper, newspaper around the base and they were not individually separated by cardboard but they remain healthy and in one piece with the planting instructions right there on the cardboard. Pretty easy to understand. One of the good things about planting container roses that are in the pots is that you can plant them at just about any time during the rain, remainder of the growing season and it makes them a lot more available to the home gardener. As long as the ground isn't frozen, you can put those roses in. Now with bare root roses, those are dormant and those should be planted probably in early, early, early spring or late winter. A hole that's about twice as wide and deep as the rose that you are planting. And in that case, we've got this one gallon pot right here. Now give your potted rose lots and lots of water. A nice long drink. You can do that while it's still in the container or you can do it once you get it into the earth, into its new home your rose in place and then you want to backfill it all the way to just above where it was planted in the pot. If you're pinched for space, think about climbers and ramblers. That's what this is. This is a, a climber going up uh, the Potager wall it's been growing here for five or six years. It's called an American Beauty Rose. It's just been a prolific, beautiful bloomer for me with a medium-sized, mid-pink, large bloom. And I've rarely had any trouble with it. It does have a tendency to get black spot once in a while, which it did this summer. But I just pull all those leaves off, strip it down to the bare canes, and it's started all over again. And it's looking, looking beautiful. And this will just keep blooming and blooming for me for many, many years. That's the beauty of roses. You can just have them for your whole lifetime. And they'll just keep on going if you take good care of them. Two and a half feet from that American Beauty rose, I planted another rose here. This one I just planted, the Alchemist from Chords. And this beautiful rose is peachy, apricotty, billowing blooms of gorgeousness. So if those climb up and pair with the American Beauty, I think we can have a really nice combination if they're blooming at the same time. I want to really encourage you to try some climbers. And we've got a lot of climbers in the Potager because there's a lot of places for them to climb. Porch and traveling down these steps and alongside the walkway is this pocket where I planted that first rose. Roses really are standalone plants, but they really do benefit, in my opinion, from some companion planting, just because oftentimes canes look like that. They're just barren. So it doesn't hurt to have some shorter plants growing along with your roses. And in this case, in this little pocket here, you can see that there's quite a bit going on here. Not only are there one, two, two climbing roses, one shrub rose. This is a David Austin rose called Molyneux with orangey, rather orangey yellowy blossoms. Gets to be about three feet tall and three feet wide. But I've underplanted it with very 
a very small herb, which is clary sage. Also, clary sage has a sort of a purple color. Also, we've got some blue say, salvia under there. There's muscari bulbs coming up already. And then purple sage over here. So we've got a lot of underplantings of plants that are no, no taller than 12 inches. So they will cover up those bare legs of the roses and enhance the colors. Because when you think about those beautiful colors together, you've got the peaches, the apricots, the pinks, mixing that with blues and purples is going to be pretty stunning. Down here I had sprinkled some English daisy seed. It's very short, 10 to 12 inch plant. Pinks, purples, and whites. And you can see that they are have germinated and they're just sporadically growing here and there. That's going to be pretty. And I'm also going to take some clematis seed. It's October. I can plant clematis seed right now. I've never planted clematis from seed, but since I've got some, I'm going to plant it right along here so that maybe those clematis could grow alongside and climb alongside the roses. Wouldn't that be nice? So here is the clematis head. Here's the seed that I'm pulling off. You can see that the seed is right here on the very tip. I'll pull those tiny seeds off and I'll just sprinkle them along the wall here, press them into the soil, keep them watered, and we'll see what happens. It's basically an experiment. This is the Wisteria Arbor. And the Wisteria has been here for as long as the Arbor, and as you can see, it is really a monstrosity right now. I really don't know that it's worth keeping anymore, and I'd prefer to have climbing roses here. To really, really put it to good use. Choosing a location for your rose, be sure that you're in a spot where you can get at least four hours of sun a day. Six hours is even better, but four hours will do, and there are even roses that will take shady spots. But most of those are the wild, rambling roses. So here is a spot that has been getting sun all day long until now, which is about five o'clock. So get, get some nice cooling shade at this time, but I've also got an arbor to climb. So this is a spot where there's one climbing rose and then I just put in another climbing rose here. Now this long stretch of picket fence here in the Potager is a perfect place for climbing roses. We've already got one climbing rose here and I've just added three more because I really want to put this vertical space to use and I don't grow anything else along this fence, except for these wild violets. Full sun, great location. This extremely thorny climbing rose has been growing here for about three years, and it's done a really wonderful job. It was not an expensive rose at all. I probably paid about $12 for this rose as a bare root rose, and of course, the season basically is over, but during the spring, this rose is just full of beautiful blooms like that, only it's just covered in those beautiful pink, airy tea rose blooms, scented of tea. Can't remember the name of it, unfortunately. I didn't used to write down the name of my roses. I just planted them. So this one needed a little bit of company because it only blooms in the spring and then later on a couple blooms at this time of year in the fall. I wanted a couple more that are a little more prolific. So two more on either side. This is called Lady Banks. This rose is a very prolific bloomer with yellow blooms, clusters of little yellow blooms. By the garden gate to the Potager and next to the flagstone steps I planted, transplanted actually, these came from another garden as well, where they were also doing horribly because of the dry conditions and the tree above them, giving them far too much shade. But these are little ground drift roses. I believe they're red, and I put two of them pretty close together. I want to make this a nice thick area of roses, and they're flanking the small, another s small dwarf blueberry bush and more strawberries, and violets, and sage. Need at least four hours of sun a day, although there are certain roses that will take semi-shade. 
and we'll talk about those maybe in another video. But the more sun, the better, except in really hot areas where the sun gets very, very hot in the late afternoon and they can handle a little bit of shade. So this one is in a great spot. This is a climber called Kiss Me Kate. It goes seven feet by four foot wide and it's going to be climbing against this picket fence in the Potager. What a great place to put climbers. I am having so much trouble with my camera right now. I'm surprised. I'll be surprised if I get through this video. But anyway, I'm really um, happy about planting against this picket fence several climbers because in front of that is my strawberry bed. And those strawberries will not get very long, I mean very tall. And then I have some dwarf blueberries in here and nothing else that's tall. So every time those flowers, those roses bloom, I'm going to get a nice full view of them all throughout the garden. Those that I actually transplanted from another section of the yard, which is a really, it was a very bad location under a tree, dry shade, it just wasn't doing anything. So I dug that one up and I'm putting this one halfway down that picket fence. This one, I can't even remember what it is, but um, it doesn't matter what it is. All roses are beautiful. Roses in another section of your yard and they're doing poorly. Check the conditions. Is it, uh, are they growing under a tree and they're not meant to be in the shade? Is it too dry there? Are they just not getting enough sun? It's really easy to dig up roses and move them. And they say you should wait till they're dormant, but I have done it at any time of the year here in Zone 7. Within a very short period of time, I was able to plant four more roses in the potager. And now the potager, believe it or not, has 20 roses in here. I don't know why I haven't done much recording on the roses before, but we'll, I will this next year. So. Most of them are planted vertically, so they're climbing the fences, the arbors, or the walls. And there are just a few going along a border here that are shrub roses. I'll film them a lot more next year. Now, what I've had in this border for about seven years are these inexpensive knockout roses, which really don't have any scent. They're really easy to grow. They're pretty roses but they don't really have any scent. So what I want to do is exchange these roses. I'll just move them somewhere else with highly scented, fragrant, old fashioned roses because it's right off the porch. I do a lot of work here and I really want to be able to smell the old fashioned scent of glorious old time ancient roses. So here's one called Rise and Shine. This is from Antique Rose Emporium. This rose gets one to two foot tall, and I bought four of these to fill a bed up front. I just want to use sort of as a ground cover. This is where the little yellow Rise and Shine roses will go. There are four of them. They're spreaders. They're low growing. They bloom only in the spring, but very profusely. So I'll have to take something else that'll pick up the slack after they are done flowering. But usually these little yellow cosmos do a pretty good job of that. So let me tell you, you've heard me complaining about lavender so many times. And here in this bed, I had planted 10 little lavenders in the spring. Well, only one of them survived and you can see him right there, that little trooper. The funny thing about my complaining about lavender all the time is that I once did a video called Anybody Can Grow Lavender. I did. I'll put a link to it below. And I really did have some great lavender back then. But ever since then, I've just never found the right location for it. That's okay. This time, I will plant my lavender from seed. If it dies, at least I haven't lost too much money. But in the meantime, Roses are the way to go. Roses have always been pretty easy for me. Roses really are not that difficult to care for. They do like to be fed. They like water and they like sun. And this doesn't look like much right now, but wait till spring. And after these little beauties bloom, like I said, they're spring bloomers, very prolific, pale yellow flowers in clusters. After that, 
I will fill in this log by putting in some seed um, of some short growing annual. And maybe even, maybe I'll put some little short poppies in here. That might be nice. In fact, I think after I've finished this video clip, I will sprinkle some poppies in this bed. We have a little bitty blossom here getting ready to open. It's a really sweet color and a very tiny rose. So here I am. Once again, I'm in a sunny location. Really nice full sun here all day long. And this has got a lot of clay in this hole right here. So I really have to work it with my fork to get that soil loosened up. I'm going to remove that soil. I'm going to mix it with some compost. I've got a nice deep hole here. Now, uh, it is October and I am fall planting these potted roses. So I'm not going to fertilize these roses because pretty soon they will go dormant. So you're not going to be fertilizing roses at this point. You'll want to wait until spring. Huh, that's bad stuff. Let's plant this potted rose, a really good drink. And this is an Abraham Darby, and this is, I believe, a David Austin rose. This is a two-gallon pot, and this one came from Antique Rose Emporium. Backfilling it with the soil. It came out of the hole in the first place. I've mixed it with a little more compost, though, because it had so much clay in it. That does not help with drainage when you've got that much clay in your soil. Roses like a lot of water, and they do like that period of sunshine. So, this is a shrub rose. It should grow about five feet tall and four feet across. Now we've planted another grouping of roses here on the courtyard and beyond that little bed behind this trellis. See the one in the middle? I transplanted that from another garden and that's a climber. Now that's going to go vertically whereas these two are going to grow as shrubs. So on this side we have Marquesa Bocella and on this side we have an Abraham Darby. And then we have that little climber in the middle that I don't know what it is. It's been around for such a long time, but I did move it from another spot. And then behind that, as you can see, is a long skinny bed, which is kind of a mess. But I've put the cardboard down from the um, rose boxes. We're going to do a, a no-dig bed here. We'll cover that cardboard with compost and grow right into the compost. I had to get a shot of this before I end this video because this is just so beautiful. This is a everlasting, I planted the seed right here in the cold frame way back in June and these are just going strong. These are everlastings also known as globe amaranth and they're like papery and you can dry, you don't even have to dry them, they just dry like this. They stay the same color for a very long time. Years, actually. And that's why they're called Everlastings. Easy to grow annual. Pinks, purples, reds, and whites. Now normally I would be planting in these big vessels and containers. I would be putting tulip bulbs in. That's what I would be planting right now. Tulip bulbs all over the place. But I didn't buy any tulip bulbs this year. I decided to take my tulip money and spend it all on bare root roses. So the bare root roses will not be planted till March. That's when they'll ship them. And then I'll pull out what's left of the mums, plant them in another garden, and I'm gonna put the bare root roses in these big containers. I'm just ready for a change back here. Not only that, roses last forever and tulips simply don't. As much as I love them, they are pretty short-lived 
perennials and often not even perennials. So let's get in the house and look at some roses online. If you're not already a full-fledged rosarian, I hope I've encouraged you to try roses for the first time, perhaps. Now I'm going to show you a couple websites that I think will be really helpful for you to find the rose that you really want for your garden that suits your tastes. The first one is David Austin, which I think is the most visually pleasing of all the websites and easiest to get around in. So this is David Austin Roses. You simply go to shop and there are so many categories here. So let's say you want apricot and orange roses. You just click on that. I'm sure I don't have to tell you any of this, but I just want to show you the beautiful um, variety that you can get here. Uh, I just sometimes will choose a name, a rose, just because of the name of it. Listen to this, Lady of Shalott, Bathsheba, wonderful, of the Lark Ascending. So here you have all these beautiful apricot colored roses, the Carding Mill, Lady Emma Hamilton, Let's say you want it to be a climber, a medium climber. I'm going to clip on, click on climbers and you are narrowed down to two roses here. And so you click on the rose you like and it gives you everything you need to know. It grows 12 feet. It's a medium climber, large blooms, a standard arch, a six foot bare wall. root rose, which would be planted in between January and May, depending on your zone or a potted rose, which would be arriving in September or October. So in either case, your rose is going to cost you $30. And I believe they have a special with shipping. I did order bare root roses from them. But the, I think their website is beautiful, easy to get around in, and just gives you all sorts of great ideas. Now another website that you may like Emporium. They are based in Texas and their website is also very nice, easy to get around in, shop the roses. I think the David Austin site is preferable as far as I'm concerned visually, but um, this one is nice too and the roses are less expensive on this site. So here we have a Belinda's Dream for example. Your roses here are going to run around $23. Gives you all the same information as the other site and you can order these right here online. However, I do believe that they charge shipping whereas David Austin does not have shipping if you order a certain amount of roses. So the shipping can be a little bit hefty. This is Chambly's Rose Nursery and this is also in Texas just like the Antique Rose Imperium. I suppose they really, really grow great roses in Texas. But what I like about them is that you can get a deal on your shipping if you get a hundred dollars worth of roses. That's five pots of roses. You get free shipping. I think it's really, really worth it. So you get a gallon pot for twenty-two dollars, and then it's free shipping if you get $100 worth of roses. I think that's a really good deal. So here you have the rose choices. Let's take a look at, and here they have different brands as well. So David Austin roses are available here if that's what you're into. Cords roses are here. Knockout roses, knockout roses get a little bit of short shrift, but I think they are really fine roses. They don't have much of a scent, but they certainly do a wonderful job in your garden. I think this apricot drift is wonderful, and I have had this peach drift growing in, in our garden for years and years and years, and it just covers the ground, and it's absolutely beautiful. So these roses don't have much of a scent, but they are disease resistant, and they just just bloom and bloom and bloom and they're very short ground covers. So this should give you a good afternoon of rose hunting if this is what you're interested in doing and I think you might get a little go, go a little bit crazy on it because they just it's just so unbelievably wonderful to look at all these gorgeous gorgeous plants. Look at some of these roses. Can you just imagine these growing in your garden? 
course, you don't have to buy your roses off of a website. You can get them anytime down at the nursery or even at Walmart for as little as $12 for a bare root rose. But whatever you decide to do, I hope you will make plans to add this beautiful plant to your garden. In the meantime, this is Jerry from Hoplong Hollow, and we will see you next time. And also, we will be doing another Hopalong Hollow Emporium within the next two weeks. And this time we're going to be featuring squirrels and chipmunks. So I will keep you posted on the community post, and I'll see you there next time. Bye. P.S. One more thing. If you don't want to plant a rose, but you just want to smell like one, this is a marvelous perfume. It's Elizabethan Rose by Penn Halligan, so you might want to try that out. Bye-bye.